I'd like to introduce our faculty member, Catherine Bruner. Catherine is a Toronto-based nutritionist, health educator, and movement teacher. She has a passion for holistic living and loves to share that in the clinic, in the classroom, and also in the studio. Catherine holds a degree in psychology and also is a graduate of the Institute of Holistic Nutrition. She is the co-owner of For the Love of Body and runs interactive workshops and events with an emphasis on hands-on learning. She teaches fermentation, soap making, and how to make natural skincare products and is a passionate advocate for living sustainably. And Catherine teaches nutrition in the environment and psychology of disease at our Mississauga and Toronto campuses. She is also one of our online instructors as well. And the next time you can find Catherine is in the Nutrition in the Environment course in September. And she's also currently starting a Psychology of Disease course on July, on June 23rd. Okay. And that, yeah, and that's running during the day, 10 to 2, and that's an eight session course as well. Okay, let's welcome Catherine Bringer. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for the warm welcome. And thank you so much to all of you who are joining me live. And also those of you who are watching the recording, thank you so much for spending part of your day with me. Um, it's always such a privilege to be part of the open houses at IHN. The program for me was such a transformative one. I spent the latter half of my 20s working for an environmental not-for-profit. And the last two years, I was working internationally, which meant a lot of flights and also a lot of living in hotel rooms without an, any access to a kitchen. And over the course of those two years, I really watched my health go down. And by the end of the two years, I ended up realizing I, I needed to make a change. And I quit and came back to Canada. And intuitively, I knew that food and nutrition would be a big component of how I helped to get my body back into balance. And I looked around in my networks and found out that I knew so many people who had attended the program and everyone spoke so highly of it. And I enrolled and I can honestly say the information that I learned at IHN really turned my health around and it helped me to get back into balance with my health. It also turned my career around and after graduation, I immediately started working in a clinic as a nutrition counselor and soon after I was lucky enough to become a faculty member at the school and it's such a joy and a privilege to get to meet new students and to watch them on their similar journeys and to see how they go out into the field and make an impact. I'm very excited today to be sharing with you a little snippet of what it's like to be in our program. So I'm going to share uh, the presentation with you now. I'm going to be speaking today on the microbiome, which is a very popular topic right now in the health and wellness world. I'll teach you a little bit about what, what a microbiome is, how we form our microbiome, how the microbiome relates to our health, as well as how it relates to the development of certain diseases and imbalances in the body. And then I'll also take you through some tips and recommendations for little things that we can do with our diet, as well as our lifestyles to really help to improve the health of our microbiome, which will improve our health overall. Now, when we talk about the microbiome, I think one of the things that I want to just take you through very quickly is what, what is a microbiome? Because I think we hear this word a lot, but sometimes we maybe hear about it in a narrow context. And so when we talk about a microbiome, a biome is a community and micro meaning microscopic. And when we talk about these microscopic communities, they are literally everywhere. They surround us. And we're going to talk today mainly about the microbiome that is in and on our bodies. But know that if we were to step outside of our homes right now, and we were to approach a tree, that tree has a microbiome on its bark. There's a microbiome underneath the ground along its root system. There's microbiomes on your coffee table and there is most certainly microbiomes on your kitchen sponge. They literally surround us. And the important thing to recognize is that in our culture, we often have a negative association when we hear certain members of these microbiomes names. If we hear bacteria, or virus or parasite, often I think our reaction is one that's negative. 
something that we think we might need to disinfect or to try to reduce or something that could be harmful to us. And with this microscopic community, this microscopic community existed long before humans did. And as humans evolved, we literally evolved with them surrounding us and inside of us. And that coevolution is so intricate and so important. There are literally now nutrients that we need as humans that the bacteria inside our body manufacture for us. Without them, we wouldn't be able to have this nutrition that is pivotal for our health. And so I, I encourage us just to think about what do we think when we hear the word virus? And especially, of course, in this time of a global pandemic, we often have this like heightened, I think, fear towards microorganisms. And it's important to know that the vast majority of these microscopic things that surround us are either benign, they do nothing to us, or they're actually beneficial for us. It's a very, very small amount that are harmful to us. The other thing that I think is also really important to highlight as we start to talk about them is that our knowledge of them is really in its infancy. We have, for a very short period of time, had the technology to actually be able to see them and identify them. That's a fairly modern ability. And we, as of yet, don't know everything about all of the microscopic um, critters, <laughs> microscopic little beings that could be in microbiomes, and we really don't yet understand the relationships between them. And so I would say we're at the infancy of our understanding, and because of that, I think there's also a lot of misinformation out there. And I think that misinformation can often happen because we have research being done in this area and then maybe a news story picks it up and they like to make sensational headlines. And while that's intention grabbing, it sometimes dilutes or it only shows a small element of the information that was discovered. So I would say that when I am looking at information that I see maybe on like products in a health food store, or maybe on skincare in a drugstore, or when I see information on the internet, often I think it's um, incorrect. And so just to be aware that uh, if you're coming across information that's presented to you as if we know this, this is the answer for sure, I would be a little bit skeptical because we really don't know yet. And so I'm going to take you through the best of what we know at this current moment in time on the microbiome. In terms of your microbiomes, you have a collection of different ecosystems or different microbiomes on your body. And if we combine all of those, the weight is about four pounds. So it's a significant part of you. There are different areas that have very distinct types of ecosystems. And the largest area that you have for ecosystems is your gut microbiome. Um, that would include organisms that are in your stomach. You also have a microbiome in your small intestine and you have a microbiome in your large intestine or colon. And the colon microbiome is the largest collection. The second largest one is the microbiome that is on the outside that is on your skin. Your skin has a microbiome. It's roughly around a pound. And then the third largest connection or collection rather, if you have one, is in your vagina. We're now also discovering that there are microbiomes in the nose, in the mouth, and in the eyes. And the most current research is now showing that there may even be a microbiome in our brain. And this is new information that's really just coming out in the last few months. The other thing that is important to know in these microbiomes that you have is within each microbiome, there is diversity. And so if we were to look at our arms right now, the microbiome that is on the back of your forearm is very, very different from the microbiome that is on the palm of your hand. And that's because the back of the forearm is a little bit drier. The back of the forearm is also has a different pH than the palm of your skin. And those different types of conditions, so how moist it is, how, um, what the pH is, is going to impact what type of microbial species want to live there. The other thing that's also very different, so we have those like intrinsic conditions of the skin, but also then what we come in contact with. 
So if you are right hand dominant, the palm of your right hand, that microbiome is very, very different from the palm of your left hand, even though the moisture and the pH might be similar because you touch more things with your dominant hand. And when you touch things, you pick up new microbes and you shut off microbes. And so we know even within similar terrains, we might also have difference de dependent on how we're interacting with the world around us. In terms of how many there are, there's different numbers that float around. Generally, we know that they are in the trillions, and one of the most accepted numbers is around 58 trillion microbes live in and on you. But within all of those microbes, there's also a big variety of different species. So for example, Lactobacillus acidophilus being a species, you have hundreds of different species of bacteria living in and on you. The other thing that I think is also just important to know is that I'm going to talk about bacteria and yeast mainly because we know the most about them. But in your microbiome, viruses outnumber bacteria by a huge amount, but they're really, really tiny and we don't really understand how they interplay with other members of that microbiome and how they impact our health. And so even though they number the most, we know very little about them. So as more and more research is done and as we start to understand these relationships, the, the role of the microbiome will start to become clearer and clearer. Now, in terms of some of these little species, so we've got like a number of different ones that um, are, are not so well understood. We have little protozoas, we have like miniature little like uh, um, almost like spiders as well that like live on our skin, little tiny mites that live on our skin. And again, that can sometimes I think be a little bit jarring to hear. So I'm sorry if that makes anybody uncomfortable, but like there's miniature tiny spiders that live on your eyelashes. Your eyelashes have a microbiome that's different than your eye. And they actually help to clean your eyelashes and they keep your eyes from getting infections and they keep them healthy. And so we're not gonna go into the world of all of the little like interesting critters that are in there. I'm gonna focus mainly on bacteria and a little bit on yeast as we start to move through a little bit more information about your personal microbiome. So in terms of the microbial evolution, um, you receive some microbes while you're developing in the womb. And this is a piece of mince information that's often um, out in the world, is I think for a long time we thought that the fetus was fairly sterile, but we're now seeing that that's not necessarily true. So there are microbes that get through the placental barrier, and so there's already some development of microbiomes in the womb, but certainly as you pass through the vaginal canal, you get a large inoculation. And so that is covering your skin. You start to inoculate your skin microbiome, but also the infant will ingest some of that. And that starts to inoculate the inside of the body with various microbiomes. Then in those especially a few hours after birth, what's touching you, what's coming in contact with you starts to also inoculate your microbiome. And then as you breastfeed, you get more again from your mother. Now, in infancy, you have much more Bifidobacterium longum, which is a specific species, and they help you to digest milk. As you're weaned and you start to eat your first foods, the lactobacillus species start to go up. And so there's some big changes that happen when you're quite young, but roughly around two years, three years, some researchers say a thousand days, we start to develop more stability in that microbiome and the changes are less and less. Those first few years of life are quite pivotal in terms of determining what our own microbiome will look like. Now, in terms of as we continue to age, those foods that we choose make a big difference in the diversity of species that are in our microbiome. For example, if I tend to eat more sugary foods, then I will feed species that like sugars, they will replicate, their numbers get bigger, and that will start to crowd out other species. Or if I'm not eating enough fiber, for example, then I'll start to starve out certain species, their numbers will go down, something else will take that space up. And so we know the diet has a very big impact as well on some of these changes in diversity that happens with the microbiome. And what we do know is that if we were to compare a culture of peoples who are eating a more ancestral diet and compare that to a more Western diet, or sometimes that's called a standard American diet, there are huge differences in the diversity of species. And in fact, there are certain species that are no longer present in that modern diet individual.
What we know from animal studies is that it takes about three generations before those changes become irreversible. Meaning that if we had a mouse that came from eating an ancestor, like it's, it's traditional diet, what mice are meant to eat, and then we take the litter and we feed that litter higher sugar foods, and then that litter passes on, that change microbiome to the next litter, three generations, and we can no longer go back. If you were to those third generation pups, give them again the diet that their grandmother ate, you wouldn't be able to reverse it. You can't go back. Now, what we don't know is, is that a bad thing? Is it better to have a microbiome more similar to our ancestors? Or is it important that some of these environmental shifts have also happened? We don't really know the answer to that, but we know that there is less diversity now among westernized populations compared to what our ancestors' microbiome would have looked like. The other thing that has a huge impact on the development of our microbiome is how much we move. People who move more, who exercise more, will have more diversity of species in their microbiome than people who have a more sedentary lifestyle. And we do know that that's also sometimes a product of our modern world is that we tend to be a little bit more sedentary or we might be sedentary for a large part of the day and then maybe go you know, exercise for half an hour and then we're sedentary again. And that's a very different pattern from what our grandparents and our great grandparents, how they would have moved in the world. Generally, they were more active than we are now. The other big difference as well from maybe how our great grandparents or grandparents would have lived is the amount of time that we spend indoors. Currently now, the average North American spends 93% of their day inside, which to me seems like such a staggering percentage to digest. But that's a, a huge difference from our ancestors. We, we evolved to be in interaction with our environment, our outdoor environment. And so to have transitioned over you know, relatively short number of generations when we think of human evolution to spending so much time indoors, that again changes what I'm in contact with in my, my world. And that will change how my microbiome develops. The other thing that has also changed quite radically is how, and I'm, I'm just air quoting, like how clean we are. And if I were to think again of my great grandmother, she wouldn't have had access to synthetic antibacterial and antimicrobial cleaning products. And that has an impact on, again, the diversity in our own microbiomes now. And there's been research that looks at very specific differences, and it's incredible what, what they find. For example, if you hand wash your dishes versus using a dishwasher, that creates a change in your microbiome because dishes that come out of a dishwasher are more sanitary. And so if you're, if you're using hand washing, then when you eat off your spoon, when you eat off your fork, you're taking in more microbes, and that actually enhances the diversity that you have. They've even found that the frequency with which you vacuum your home has an impact on the diversity of your microbiome. So perhaps this is an invitation to clean a little less this week and spend a little bit more time outside. The other thing that I think is really fascinating with our microbiomes is that they are unique to us. And often we refer to this as your, your microbial fingerprint. Um, and that microbial fingerprint similar to a fingerprint is unique to you. And so if I think about like touching my, my finger <laughs> on a surface, I would leave my print behind. In the same way, when I'm just inside somewhere, I'm shedding species and that is a unique shedding to me. In fact, there are forensic and crime labs in the United States that have actually used the microbiome fingerprint that someone leaves behind to ID suspects in robberies and, and other types of crimes, which is an interesting thing to know. And when we um, look at and examine, well, how long does it take for us to leave this fingerprint behind? In a room, it's about 20 minutes. If you're in a space, a new space to you for 20 minutes, you've left your fingerprint behind. We would know that you have been there. In terms of moving into a new home, it takes one day for you to inoculate the entire home with your fingerprint that you leave behind, which is really fascinating. Now, the, the base kind of your fingerprint, that remains stable. 
And so that fingerprint that I leave behind when I'm 20 is going to be very similar when I'm 30 or 40 or 50. That very much is, is, is like a fingerprint. It stays with me, but there are small, small variations. We are constantly shedding. So they fall off of our body. We breathe them out. When you use the bathroom, you get rid of a lot of microbes, especially in your feces. Um, and then we take them on. So same idea. If I touch something, I'm also not just leaving behind my microbes, but I'm picking up whatever was on that surface that I touched. When I go outside and I walk through a forest, soil microbes are picking up through the air and they're landing on my skin and I'm breathing them in. When I eat foods, those foods have microbes on them and then I'm taking those foods into my body. And so there are these small changes, but the base of your print is pretty much the same throughout your life. The other thing that's really interesting with this co-evolution of these microbes and us is when we look at the relationship between gut bacteria and our immune system, these have now co-evolved together where our immune system needs our gut bacteria in order to keep us safe, in order to know what is a pathogen and how do I protect myself from infection or attack. With your immune system. There's a few branches of your immune system. Um, in this context, we're talking about your adaptive immune system, the part of your immune system that needs to learn what is friendly, what do I leave alone, and what is a foe, what is harmful for me. And what seems to happen is it's the microbes in the gut that tell your immune system, this is a foe, you should attack. And when the immune system attacks, it does so through the process of inflammation. Other things that are important to note in terms of the diversity and health of our microbiome is also the medications that we might be exposed to throughout our lifetime. And the one that we hear about the most in the context of microbiomes is, of course, broad spectrum antibiotics. And broad spectrum means that it targets a, like a number of different species of bacteria. And so when we do a broad spectrum antibiotic, it not only takes out or targets the one that we think is causing harm, but it will also take out some of the friendlies. And this is why broad spectrum antibiotics are often considered uh, not desirable in terms of keeping the health of our microbiomes intact. The other thing that I think is important to note with um, antibiotics is that 70% of the antibiotics that we create aren't intended for human use. They're made for conventional agriculture, and they're not necessarily used to prevent or treat infection in animal, but rather they're often added to animal feed in order to get the animals to grow faster, to fatten faster. And so one of the issues is that even if you are not taking antibiotics often yourself, you may be being exposed to them through the foods that you eat. Now, the other big concern with this um, use of antibiotics, both if we're thinking about taking it potentially as humans, but also because they're in conventional agriculture, is bacteria are able to share genes very easily and they replicate in staggering numbers. And with that sharing of genes, it's very different from the process of a human where in order for us to change something about us, we have to pass that down through several generations. It can take a long time to create these changes. Bacteria can just swap genes. Um, if I was in a really rudimentary way trying to like describe how that like could happen, thinking about it as a human, you know, if I looked at a friend of mine and they had a beard and I thought, oh, well, it's getting cold and maybe that beard would be useful for staying warm, I could literally just say, hey, give me that beard gene. And then pff, I have a beard. You know, so when we're talking about bacteria, one of the things that is a concern with this use of antibiotics being rampant is that always you will have some bacteria that are able to survive. And those bacteria that are able to survive the application of an antibiotic, we start to call those superbugs or antibiotic resistant bacteria because we no longer have something to, to kill them. And that's a really big concern because we in Canada, and especially I, I know the area where I am around the GTA a little bit better, but we've had a number of hospitals around the GTA who have had issues with super bugs. And the best response that we have right now, if somebody has an infection with one of these bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics, is just to try and give them the strongest dose of the strongest ones that we possibly have. And that can be really hard on the body. 
And so as a, as a country and as a medical system, we really have to address this issue of superbugs and trying to figure out how can we not um, respond by just using these antibiotics. We need a better solution. And currently right now, scientists estimate that in the next 20 years, 400,000 Canadians will die due to superbugs. So this is an issue that's impacting us now. Um, the other concern with antibiotics, I think, is also when we um, have them at a very young age. Um, if you remember me saying we're in those first few years of life, we're really setting what that fingerprint is going to be. And what we do know is that children who receive antibiotics um, before age two um, will have a higher risk for conditions like allergies, eczema, asthma, obesity, and inflammatory bowel disease later in life, all the way into adulthood. There's also several other medications that have a big impact on the gut microbiome. Um, so we know PPIs or proton pump inhibitors have a big impact on the microbiome. We also know some synthetic food additives have a big role to play in reducing the diversity of the microbiome and stress. And of course, again, if we maybe think about modern lifestyles, they're often much higher in stress. And this might also be one of the reasons why our diversity has gone down. In terms of some of the conditions that have been connected to this imbalance or loss of diversity of species in the microbiome, um, there's many, and this is not an exhaustive list on this slide, um, but in terms of digestion, there are several different conditions that have been linked to um, this loss of diversity or imbalance in the microbiome. Um, so some acronyms here as SIBO, this is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. IBS is irritable bowel syndrome, IBD is inflammatory bowel disease, and then many other conditions, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, uh, leaky gut, which might also be called intestinal permeability or barrier dysregulation. Um, overgrowths of yeast, one could be candida. Um, we also see changes in terms of bloating, discomfort, uh, appetite changes, blood sugar imbalances, as well as food allergies. The immune system is also impacted. And again, we have this interplay, this big relationship between gut bacteria and the adaptive immune system. And um, so we do find that with those imbalances, there is higher uh, chronic inflammation, higher allergies, as well as a higher risk of certain autoimmune diseases. For skin, there's a number of different conditions that they're starting to connect to an imbalance, and this can be from the gut microbiome. It could also be from the skin microbiome itself. Things like eczema, acne, as well as other dermatitis could have a, a cause in the skin microbiome becoming imbalanced. And another thing that's also connected is premature aging. In the eye microbiome, dry eye, conjunctivitis, glaucoma, and macu macular degeneration are some of the conditions that they're starting to link back to this diversity in the eyes. Orally, um, a lot of conditions in the mouth have been connected to the oral microbiome, uh, so dental caries or cavities, uh, gingivitis, halitosis or bad breath, gum disease, dry mouth. They've also connected an imbalance in the oral microbiome to some sleep disorders. Um, so there's one study that found perhaps that there was a link between an imbalance in the oral microbiome and sleep apnea. The other one that's gotten quite a bit of, of uh, press and media coverage as well is that if we have species in the oral microbiome that are able to get into the bloodstream, which could happen if there's an abrasion in the mouth or you know, somebody flosses and their gums bleed and then some of those oral microbes get into the bloodstream, that that's been connected to potentially cardiovascular diseases. Then we also have um, disorders in the nervous system. And I'll talk in a moment about the connection between the nervous system health, our mental health, and our microbiomes, and, and what the um, theories are on how they're connected. Um, but we know that our ability to handle stress is very strongly connected to our microbiomes, as well as our propensity for developing anxiety or depression. We've also seen some connections to cognitive decline, especially as we age. Um, sometimes that diversity goes down as we're in the later years of life, and they think that might be one of the connections to why cognitive declines start to happen. Memory impairment in general, risk-taking behaviors, a lack of emotional well-being, chronic fatigue syndrome, as well as fibromyalgia. So a very, a very long list, and again, not exhaustive. 
in terms of that connection between how do our how do our microbiomes possibly impact our nervous system or our mental health um, a lot of the um, leading theories in this area is around the role of the gut brain or the nervous system that is in our in our bellies our enteric nervous system um, so in terms of the the gut brain one of the things researchers are finding is it seems to be that the microbiome is like the control system in your gut brain. And so what seems to happen is that the microbes in your, in your gut microbiome will actually signal to release certain neurotransmitters. And those neurotransmitters can have an impact on digestive function. We also know that they're capable of releasing hormones and cytokines. And cytokines are proteins that are able to stimulate the immune system, and that can turn on inflammation or turn off inflammation. And there is a um, posited link between uh, what they call cytokine storms, so a, a large amount of cytokines being released, and that being a big um, determiner of chronic inflammation, as well as autoimmune conditions. The other sort of interplay that I personally find very fascinating is um, between the gut microbiome and the vagus nerve and how that impacts our nervous system and our ability to respond to stress. And the vagus nerve, this is the longest nerve in your body and it innervates almost every major organ that you have. And what we know is vagal tone, the ability of this nerve to be able to fire is very strongly linked to your resiliency to stress your ability to shift from a sympathetic response, a fight, flight, freeze, or fawn response, or a parasympathetic nervous system response, which is our rest, digest, repair, and heal. And so it seems that when we have a, an imbalance in the gut microbiome, it changes the ability of the vagus nerve to be toned and fire easily, which might be one of the mechanisms why it means that we would be um, less stress resilient or we would be in that sort of fight or flight response more easily and have a harder time shifting into rest and digest. We also know that this communication between the vagus nerve um, and the rest of the body is responsible for the release of acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is really important in um, a, a number of different ways. But one of the things that it does is it tells the immune system not to overreact to microbes, meaning that it tells your immune system, don't attack these ones. These are friendly. They're not hurting you. This is not a pathogen or a foe. And so if the immune system starts to attack things that it's not meant to, that can further cause issues in the microbiome. And that also might be one of those pathways that starts to lead towards the development of autoimmune conditions. Um, this, this image here, this comes from a study by Prescott um, and, and others, and it's called Biodiversity of the Human Microbiome and Mental Health. And this is one of the theories that exists between this interaction between the microbiome and, and mood disorders, anxiety, depression, uh, as well as things like obsessive compulsive disorders and, and other mood disorders. And so what we have here in, in the image on the left-hand side is we have some of these big factors that are contributing to a loss of diversity. Less outdoor physical activity, less time in nature, interacting with nature, and a less diverse diet, and also a diet that's higher in processed foods and refined sugars. And all of those three are huge factors in less microbial diversity which then means that we have changes in the ability of both our gut and our skin to maintain its barriers. And this could again be called a barrier dysregulation in the gut. We might again kind of more commonly think about this as leaky gut. And that then means that we could have immune dysregulation. So if some of these microbes that aren't meant to be in our bloodstream get into our bloodstream, the immune system attacks them. And that inflammation also appears in the brain. And then that inflammation in the brain may be what's causing anxiety and depression. Now, once we have anxiety, depression, we might also then see a, a negative feedback loop where because we're then stressed, stress also reduces the microbiome. And so again, less diversity, perhaps more of this permeability, more inflammation. But also if we're feeling anxious or depressed, we might be less likely to do some of those things that are far over on the left. Maybe that means that because 
And then again, think that like with less diversity in the gut microbiome, we might also have more sugar cravings. We might end up desiring more processed foods and then that leads back. Maybe we don't have the motivation to be going outside, to be moving our bodies. And so we get into this real negative feedback response. This is one of the um, explanations that's been put forward called the biodiversity hypothesis. Um, but again, our knowledge is in its infancy and, and much more work needs to be done. Okay. Now, I'd, I'd like to spend some time going over some of the things that we can do in terms of the foods that we're choosing, as well as some of those really important lifestyle factors. So we can start to really think about how do I enhance the health of my microbiomes? And I'll try and provide a, a lot of suggestions and tips here. And please, again, know if you have questions, just type them, type them in the chat. In terms of what to avoid, there's several that I would recommend, and one would be to avoid unfiltered tap water. Um, again, of course, the, the benefit to being online is you could be from a number of different areas around the world, um, but, but for those of um, you who are in the Toronto area like myself and have Toronto tap water, um, we do know that studies that have examined Toronto tap water have found superbugs or these antibiotic resistant species of bacteria coming out of our tap water. Um, so I, I'm, I'm a big fan of filtering water. Um, in terms of water filters, I prefer that over buying, um, buying water. Um, in general, most water that we buy often comes in plastic, which I don't think is environmentally sustainable. Um, I, I also don't like giving companies money for bottling water, and a lot of those companies might actually be bigger companies I don't want to support, like Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola. And the other thing that in the United States, they actually tested uh, bottled water and also found superbugs in bottled water. So it, it might also mean that buying water isn't actually ensuring that it's properly filtered. Um, there's a number of fantastic filters that you can explore um, that meet a variety of different budgets. Um, I have no affiliations or, or sponsorships with, with any type of company. It's just not something that I, I personally do. Um, but there is a, a brand that you can find in Canada called Berkey, uh, B-E-R-K-E-Y. Um, that's the filter that I have in my house. It's a standalone. Um, so if you don't know how long you're going to be in the place that you're living, if you might be moving, it's portable. It, it's one that I generally recommend. The other thing that's also in, in unfiltered tap water is chlorine, of course, as a disinfectant to keep harmful microbes down. Um, but the chlorine that is in tap water is, is enough that when we drink it, it can change our oral microbiome and our gut microbiome. So chlorine is an antimicrobial. It kills some of those microbes. Um, so what you can do in some municipalities is let your water uh, off gas, meaning that the chlorine will, when, it's, when you put water, say, in a glass, um, and you just leave it out, the chlorine will eventually off gas depending on the form of chlorine in your tap water. Some municipalities have a form of chloramine that will not off gas, so it depends a little bit. Um, but if you don't have a filter um, and you know that you have the form of chlorine that could off gas, then you could also try and do that. Um, conventional meat can contain superbugs. And the image that we have here on the right, this comes from the Environmental Working Group, which is a US based not for profit. Um, so these numbers here are based on samples that they've done with US meat. It is different in Canada. Our numbers are not quite as high. However, the University of Michigan, I believe it was in 2009, um, tested Canadian pork. There's been other um, marketplace did a test of Canadian chicken. And in both of those studies, they found superbugs in samples of Canadian meat. Um, so I generally prefer to find meat and animal products that are not coming from a conventional stream so we can lower our risk of being exposed to superbugs. Um, synthetic emulsifiers. Um, some synthetic emulsifiers, especially one called po polysorbate 80, has been studied and found to really inhibit or um, decrease some of the diversity in our, in our microbiome. That might be one that you avoid. There are probably many, many others, but um, again, our knowledge is still in its infancy. Uh, as much as possible, I try and avoid synthetic processed ingredients. They, my ancestors wouldn't have been able to, to digest them. And so if I'm thinking about um, how to approach my own microbiome, I try and eat as much as I can as naturally and unprocessed as possible. 
Um, and of course, like hydrogenated fats are highly, highly processed, and those have been studied, and they do seem to impact, again, the diversity of species in our microbiome, as do artificial sweeteners. Um, pesticides, things like Roundup or Bt, both of those are also used when we genetically modify certain crops, so Roundup ready crops or things like Bt corn or Bt cotton. Um, so I do prefer to avoid GMOs. I do also prefer to avoid, when possible, crops that are sprayed with pesticides or herbicides. Um, again, those are often antimicrobial, um, they might be antifungal, and if those traces are getting into my body, then that can impact my microbiome. A local organization for us in, in Canada is Environmental Defense. They're a fantastic organization. If you haven't uh, checked them out yet, please do. They, they do a lot of great work and they also try and push for a lot of legislative changes. They have a lot of petitions that try and do things like clean up our skincare in terms of getting some of the toxins out of our skincare and also in terms of helping Canadian homes to be healthier by having better regulations from the government and on products. And there's a, a really fantastic report on there where they tested common foods that we give to our children to see whether or not there was residue from Roundup moving up into those finished food items. They tested things like Cheerios and hummus and crackers, and they found that in a lot of these foods, they could find measurable amounts of glyphosate. It's a great study to check out, and you can find that at environmentaldefense.ca. Um, other things that are good to include. Um, so in terms of um, including foods that will enhance the diversity in our microbiome, ones that are fantastic are fresh fruits and vegetables. And when we think about uh, fruit or a vegetable growing, it is just like if we step outside right now, surrounded by microbiomes. And so when it is surrounded by those microbiomes, it's going to have some of that on the outside, but just like us, some of it gets inside. So for example, if I were to um, wash a carrot, I might wash off some of the microbes that are on the outside of that carrot, but on the inside of the carrot, where you can't wash it away, there are still lactobacillus species of bacteria. And when we look at those lactobacillus strains, 35% of them are able to survive gastric conditions and get into our guts, which uh, gastric conditions, I mean things like your stomach gets very acidic, uh, at the top of your small intestine, the pancreas releases bile, and, and sometimes that can cause certain species to die because they don't like that um, low acidity or um, being very acidic, or they don't like the, the pH being more alkaline, like being spit out at the top of the small intestine. And so um, when we talk about surviving gastric conditions, it means that they don't die. They're able to make it all the way down into our colon. The other type of food that is fantastic for species diversity is omega-3 fats. And in terms of omega-3 fats, um, there's a number of fantastic sources that you can find, uh, especially cold water fatty fish produce a high amount of omega-3s. Um, so things like uh, salmon, uh, things like trout, also some of the smaller fish like anchovies and uh, herring and mackerel, but these all have a high amount of omega-3 fats. Um, nuts and seeds also contain omega-3 fats, things like chia and flax and hemp seeds are fantastic sources. In terms of foods, um, prebiotics and probiotics are also very important. Prebiotic means that it's food for your microbiome. And so when we talk about prebiotic foods, these are generally complex carbohydrates and they end up being food for the microbiome in your digestive system, in your colon, and sometimes your small intestine. And so when we talk about prebiotic fibers, I've listed a number of the foods and vegetables here that have the highest amounts. Um, sunchokes, sometimes also called Jerusalem artichoke, if you're not familiar with the word sunchoke. Artichoke, chicory, endive, asparagus, onion, garlic, leek, beet, fennel, lentils, beans, broccoli, but especially broccoli stalks. These would be some fantastic sources of prebiotic fibers. And when we're choosing these prebiotic fibers, diversity is important. Having different prebiotics throughout the week help to enhance the different diversities, the different strains. 
So different species will want to eat different things. And so if you include more diversity of prebiotics, you will also enhance the diversity in your microbiome. Then we have probiotic foods and probiotic foods would be fermented foods and fermented foods um, when we do fermentation, we are creating conditions to increase the population of certain bacteria and yeasts. And those bacteria and yeasts, because their populations are increasing during fermentation, and then we eat those fermented foods, we're taking that diversity of microbes that we created through fermentation into our bodies. Um, now with fermented foods, I think it's fantastic that they have become so popular again in the last few years. And we see more and more options in grocery stores across the country in terms of different types of fermented foods. I will give you some specific um, tips on which ones to choose because there are some that are better than others and there are some that are entirely fake. They're not fermented at all, but you might think that they are. So I'll take you through that. Um, but of course, some of our most maybe popular ones are the ones that we're most familiar with. Uh, sauerkraut, miso, kimchi, kefir, cheeses, yogurts, uh, vinegars, and kombucha. Um, so when we look at these fermented foods, um, one of the th things that uh, we know is a regular intake of them has been found to improve cognition, how we think, our emotional regulation, it reduces social anxiety, seems to be able to repair the gut and lower inflammation overall. And again, with a lot of these different studies, it seems to just like our prebiotic fibers suggest that diversity is the name of the game meaning that instead of having only kombucha or only eating sauerkraut, having a large variety of fermented foods in your diet seems to have a better impact than eating the same one every day. Now, in terms of fermented foods, when we're looking at the store, there's a couple of things that you should look out for. And one is that it's actually raw and unpasteurized. And in terms of fermented foods, one of the things that is uh, very typically done is um, we might have foods that were traditionally fermented foods that are now being mass produced and they still have their original name, but it's no longer a fermentation process. And I think the easiest example to use for this is sauerkraut. If we were to go to almost any big box grocery store, we would be able to find the Bix brand in Canada and they would sell sauerkraut and they have things like um, dill pickles and pickled beets and pickled onions. And if we stand in front of that shelf, sauerkraut, this is a traditionally fermented food. But the kraut that Bix sells is not fermented. And if we were to look at the ingredients, we would see cabbage and we would see vinegar listed. So they are not fermenting it. They're not letting acids build up through the process of fermentation. They're adding vinegar and that's preserving the food and giving it that flavor that develops in fermentation. And so it might say kraut, <laughs> they're allowed to call it sauerkraut, but it is not actually fermented. Similar to the beets and the onions and the dill pickles, a brand like Big Cells, they're not actually fermented, they're using vinegar. And so it has the flavor of fermentation, um, but it is not actually fermented, which means that you don't have this population of bacteria and yeast that's developing through, through fermentation that's then adding diversity for you and doing wonderful things as it passes through you. Um, so you want to check for that. If it is in the aisles, it is likely not actually fermented. The other thing that you can look for sometimes is if it says pasteurized. There are examples of foods that could have had the vinegar added to it and then they're pasteurized, but you also sometimes find foods that were perhaps fermented, but then they pasteurize them to make them shelf stable. And an example of this could be kombucha. There's a number of kombucha brands that you can find even at a fancy store like Whole Foods and it's in the aisles. And if you read the label, it says pasteurized. And on the back, it will tell you that they fermented this kombucha, but because they pasteurized it, that application of heat will have killed off those colonies of bacteria and yeast that they developed in fermentation. So when you drink it, it now doesn't actually have any, any probiotic benefit for you. Other things to look for, um, for especially things like kombucha, I would say like look at how much sugar is in the final product. And that would also go for dairy. Um, there are a number of brands of dairy for things like yogurt and kefir that have a very high sugar content. 
And if you remember me saying earlier, if we're choosing higher sugar foods, we tend to feed the strains of bacteria that like sugars. And so those numbers get bigger. And because there's more of them, they're going to start to create sugar cravings because they want more food. And so you want to be careful that you are choosing forms of dairy that are fermented and that don't have added sugars in them. For dairy as well, higher fat would be better for the microbiome. And that's because if they're taking the fat out of dairy, they're, they're increasing the sugar relative to the fat. And again, then you may inadvertently be feeding those sugar loving species. Um, with fermented foods, I think um, one thing just to know, especially if we're talking about vegetables, is that um, some of us may not be able to tolerate fermented foods. And that might be because of pre-existing conditions that are in the gut. Um, for example, if somebody has an issue with digesting FODMAPs, certain forms of those complex carbohydrates, then something like sauerkraut probably wouldn't agree with them because cabbage is, is high in FODMAPs. Um, if somebody has um, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO, um, they might also find that fermented foods don't work for them. It might create some bloating if they try them. If somebody has a, a low tolerance to histamine, um, they might also not tolerate fermented foods well because when foods ferment, generally histamine levels are higher in those fermented foods. And so there are some conditions where they might not work for everyone. Um, for me, one of the things that I really encourage is to learn how to make your own. Um, I really think for one, buying fermented foods, if we're now looking for the fermented foods that are the, the good ones in the store, so they're in the refrigerator section, they actually have a diversity of species in them, um, it, can, it be, can get expensive, right? So we want to, these are foods that we want to have a diversity of and we want to be eating them regularly. I tend to aim to eat a fermented food every day and I try to create diversity. You know, again, if we think about like our, our ancestors, they were, every culture around the world had a diversity of fermented foods that they made. They didn't have fridges, they, they needed to out of necessity, but that would have meant that they were eating quite a bit of them. And so I, I try and mimic that by including them with more frequency in, in my own diet. Um, but what I think is, is great is if you make your own, you can save money doing that. It's, it's very easy. Might also connect you to some of the things that maybe your great grandparents made, which is always really fun to find those cultural stories to our foods and our histories. And you can also make something that's way tastier. Um, so, you know, lots of different ways to ferment things that usually aren't as widely available in the grocery store. Um, so this here is a blueberry vinegar that I made. Um, so lots of different types of vinegars you can make very easily. I have a strawberry rhubarb vinegar that's going right now with the season's rhubarb, which is fantastic. Um, this here is a rhubarb kimchi. Um, so I used orange rind, fresh ginger, I have some mustard seeds in there, and then again, rhubarb from the garden. This is a fantastic little condiment, fantastic like, little pop of that sour flavor of the rhubarb. Um, this is a chickpea miso. Uh, this was aged for a year, and I have seaweed in there, as well as some hot peppers from the garden and some garlic. And what I really love with fermenting food on your own is you can make these flavors that you can't find. I've never seen anyone sell this in a store and it is the most delicious thing that you could possibly eat. I am obsessed with it and so it's great to be able to make those flavors that you love. The other thing that I'll just quickly mention on fermented foods um, is that when foods are fermented it means that the bacteria and yeast in those foods have started to partially digest or pre-digest what's in here. And that means that when you eat that food, it is easier for your body to assimilate the nutrients. You know, so for example, in the picture here, I've got a curtido that I make, which is cabbage and onion and jalapeno and carrot and lime. And cabbage, it's a remarkably healthy food for us, but cabbage is fairly hard to digest. Chickpeas, garlic, very healthy for us, but they're difficult to digest. If I were to eat these foods unfermented, I would get some bloating. And that's a little bit of an indicator that I'm not actually fully assimilating those foods well. If I ferment them, I have no problem with it. And so I get more of a benefit of eating the fermented forms of these food because I'm actually able to pull the nutrients into my body. The other thing that's pretty amazing with the fermentation process is we make additional nutrients. 
Um, so for example, the bacteria, the lactobacillus family of bacteria, they actually make additional B vitamins. They help to maintain vitamin C. And so it's just a, a whole incredible nutrient dense way to transform foods, making them better to digest, adding nutrition to them. I can't possibly go on about fermented foods. Um, I love them so much. We could do an entire open house on them, but I'm going to, I'm going to uh, digress for now. Um, I do run uh, classes on this in Toronto. We normally run them in person and we massage things together, um, but we are starting to do them online because of the pandemic. And we do have one on the 28th. Um, so we're going to make a kraut as well as a brine vegetable. So you can find information on my website if you want to join and learn how to make some fermented foods. Some misconceptions that I want to just quickly take you through because I think it makes us better consumers and it helps us to also understand how they work in the body and also maybe ask questions when we are being marketed products. So one is most probiotics do not actually colonize your microbiome which what we mean by colonize is if I were to take a probiotic supplement or if I was to eat a spoonful of my tasty rhubarb kimchi, um, those species don't actually colonize, meaning that they become part of my fingerprint. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not beneficial. In fact, they are. So in terms of what those probiotics seem to be doing is they have a transitory effect. I eat it. It moves through my oral microbiome, my stomach microbiome, small intestine, colon, and as it moves through, it does beneficial things for me. And some of the things they do as they're moving through is they can signal the release of neurotransmitters and hormones. They can help muscles to contract. Uh, peristalsis is what we call the rhythmic contractions of smooth muscles in the digestive system, and that's what controls the speed at which food moves through, which is important for nutrient assimilation and digestion, also too fast, diarrhea, too slow, constipation. And so some of that transitory effect is helping to regulate that contraction. It also is really important for modulating gene expression, which is a whole interesting area that's just starting to be explored. Um, and it also helps us to make short chain fatty acids. And these short chain fatty acids are important food for our colon. They also may play a role in helping to lower inflammation. Now, if you are buying a probiotic supplement, or if you are buying a yogurt that is claiming to be probiotic, they have to show you what the CFUs are. And CFU means how many of these um, bacteria in this supplement or in this food survive the gastric conditions and are able to get alive to your gut. Now, I'll just say that this may also be a misconception in that there are studies that show that it doesn't really matter if they're alive or not. So that might mean that they have a benefit in your mouth, they have a benefit in your stomach, and then they die. So it doesn't really matter if they don't make it all the way down to your colon. But there's also some studies that show that dead bacteria have a benefit, which might mean that once that dead bacteria gets down into your colon, it has a shape. And other microbes in there might be responding to it. Your immune system might be responding to that shape. So it also appears that that might not be that important. So again, just beware of marketing. We don't really have the answers yet to know whether or not CFU is important or whether or not the total number is important. There are studies that show a benefit of taking a probiotic supplement that has only 8 million, which is a very small number when we think of how tiny these species are. And then there's some supplements that get up into the trillions in a single capsule. And we don't necessarily know that bigger is better. So again, you've got to sort of figure out what you're being marketed and is there actually research that backs up those claims that they make. The other thing that is also really important to note, and, and this is one that's uh, largely missing from supplementation, is that when we talk about lactobacillus being a strain, that's a little bit incorrect. Within lactobacillus acidophilus, there are many, many different types of lactobacillus acidophilus that further breaks down, or uh, lactobacillus ruteri, the many, many different strains within that. And there are very few supplement companies that will tell you when you look on the back which strains within that, say, lactobacillus acidophilus family that they're using. But what we know is that those strain varieties have a very different impact on what they do in your body when, they when you take them. And that information is still, again, in its infancy, and we don't really see that in a lot of supplement companies.
So again, we need to be, I think, asking more questions. And I think we need more research on strain specificity. The other thing that I think is also just really important to know in terms of like misconceptions is that there is no ideal gut microbiome meaning that there is no way that one probiotic supplement could be the answer for every single person because we all have that unique fingerprint. We also don't know, is there, is there an ideal period? Um, you know, so for example, is it better for me to have the microbiome that my great grandmother has? Well, my great grandmother didn't come in contact with all of the environmental things that I come in contact with. There are many like plastics didn't exist, you know, when my great grandmother was alive. So maybe part of the way that my microbiome has changed has also been in a protective way. So we don't necessarily have the answers to that. Um, we also don't necessarily know is diversity better. So for example, when we compare, let's say, my microbiome to um, a human that's been living in the middle of the Amazon rainforest and they haven't had contact with anything that's processed or synthetic, if we were to take their microbiome and through a fecal transplant put it in my body, we don't actually know that I would have better health because of that. So again, the idea that there is an ideal is not actually truth. In terms of supplements, um, one thing that I think is really important is for us to get better research, again, on that strain specificity. And also just to note that many brands sell strains because they're easy to make in a laboratory and they're easy to encapsulate. Um, and they'll stay, uh, they'll stay alive in that capsule for a period of time so they can create a shelf life out of it, um, not necessarily because they're the best ones for, for you. So again, you really have to like ask questions and, and look at the marketing behind it. The other huge area where I'm starting to see this is in the skincare industry. And um, the skincare cosmetic industry in North America is not very well regulated. And you can buy skincare right now that has probiotics in it for acne, probiotics in it for eczema, probiotics in it for <laughs> premature aging. And, and we really are in like, so the beginnings of understanding the skin microbiome. And as I mentioned, there's diversity. So how are are you making a lotion that's good for my whole skin microbiome when it's so different from area to area? And although I think this is very promising, we're not there yet for a company to 